Grace to you and peace from God, Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was in high school, I absolutely despised writing papers. I just could not stand writing. But what was worse than just writing a normal paper was writing research papers. They were absolutely the bane of my existence as a high schooler. Now, from what I understand, research papers are the types of papers where I'm supposed to do some research and reading and learning and come to a conclusion, and then you write the paper based on what you have learned. Yeah, that's not how I did research papers in high school. That was way too much work. It was much easier and much more efficient to write the paper first and then do the research. Because after you have written the paper and come to your conclusions, it's not terribly difficult to find a couple of sources, skim through it, and find a quote or two that backs up the conclusion you've already drawn, insert it into the paper, and there you go, paper's done, no fuss, no fuss. Why did I prefer to write papers, research papers that way? Because it's easier. It takes less time. Because when you've already decided what you're looking for, finding it is really pretty easy. Now, you can laugh at the ridiculousness of my high school self. I probably deserve it. Um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that this is true. When you've already decided what you're looking for, finding it is really pretty easy. We see this in many different areas of our lives, especially in terms of the convictions that people have regarding religion or politics or anything else. They've already decided what they think, and so finding support for their position is really pretty easy. Then again, the opposite is also true. If you don't know what you're looking for, then it's nearly impossible to find it. Now, the story of Samuel kind of gives us an illustration of this. You remember this story maybe from Sunday school, and of course we just heard the words read. Samuel, he was a Young boy, he was serving uh, in the Lord's house at Shiloh, an uh, assistant, basically, of the priest Eli. And, in effect, Samuel was a full-time altar boy. He attended to the various things that Eli would have him do, which was probably of great use to Eli, who was getting to be an old man. And he was uh, having difficulty with his eyesight, uh, and was not able to see very well. So having this young boy around to do the various tasks and upkeep that were required at the Lord's house was probably quite helpful for him. We, we don't know exactly what Samuel's tasks were, um, but there was a lot of work to be done, and no doubt he contributed to that. But, but this story from 1 Samuel chapter 3 actually begins with Samuel sleeping. And it was sometime during the middle of the night, maybe the early morning, when all of a sudden he was awakened to a voice. And the voice seemed to be calling him. And so Samuel, he gets up out of bed and, and hurries to Eli's room and says, You called me? Here I am. And Eli, you can almost picture the, the scene in your mind, rolls over in bed, pulling the covers up a little higher, maybe giving a bit of an annoyed sigh. I didn't call you, kid. Go back to bed. Maybe you parents have been woken up in the middle of the night by one of your kids and can maybe understand how Eli might have felt. So Samuel only goes back to bed. And not much time passes, and his voice comes again. Samuel! Well, if the voice the previous time was just Samuel's imagination, this wasn't. I mean, it called his name clear as day. So Samuel gets up and he hurries to Eli's bed. Eli, you called me. Here I am. And the sigh comes again. Eli rolls over again. I didn't call you. I go back to bed. 
So Samuel trudges back down the hall to his bed. And he's laying there, probably still awake, wondering what's going on. And again, he hears this voice. You have to imagine Samuel probably got up a little bit slower this time. He wasn't quite so enthusiastic about going to Eli's bed. He might have been wondering, is this a trick? But it was his job to attend to Eli, and so he got up and he did. He went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. And this is where the story gets interesting, though. Because Eli, you, again, you can almost picture what might have happened. Maybe Eli sits up in bed and looks at Samuel for a second, kind of staring at him, just awkward silence, and then he finally speaks. It, it wasn't me who called you. It was the Lord. And so, Eli sends Samuel back, but this time he gives him instructions. The next time you hear this voice speak to you, I want you to respond with these words. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And as we heard in the middle of our reading, that's exactly what happens. The Lord speaks again, and Samuel responds. This time, though, Samuel knew what he was looking and listening for, and so he was able to find and discern the voice of the Lord. Now, the reading continues, and there's a number of interesting things that happen in the rest of our reading that would be worth consideration, but I want to pause here and just reflect on this portion of the story and what it is that the Lord has to teach us through this portion of the Samuel's experience. See, this part of Samuel's story, it teaches us how we need to be looking for God's action in our world in order to truly be able to find it. Now, we need to be a bit careful how we apply this to our lives today, because the fact is, the Lord tends to work in our world a bit differently than he did back then. The Lord doesn't typically make it a habit of uh, appearing in the middle of the night to someone and audibly calling to them, although we don't rule out that possibility that he could if he so chose. But he doesn't typically act in that way. But that also doesn't mean that the Lord never speaks or acts in our world, because he does. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, can we see it? Can we find evidence that the Lord is working in our world today? And we ask this question of ourselves quite often. There are a number of examples I could give, but just think for a moment about our current pandemic situation. Many people look for the Lord in this pandemic. They ask questions like, is this pandemic meant to teach us something? Is the Lord condemning our nation or our world through this pandemic? Or what about the good news on the vaccine front? Is this the Lord's blessing of us? Maybe we can think more personally for a second. Maybe we ask questions like, what is the Lord trying to teach me through this experience? Is he punishing me for something I've done? What about my friend who contracted COVID-19? Is the Lord angry with them? Or what about our current political situation? Can we find the Lord there? Did the Lord allow those recent events at our nation's capital because he was angry with us? Or was he judging our nation's leaders for what they've been doing or not doing? Look, these are all questions that you and I ask. And they're all just a different wording of this deeper question. Where is God in my particular situation. Maybe the form of the question that 
you ask is one that I just spoke out loud, or maybe it's slightly different, but the reality is we all ask this question, where is God in my life? Now let me be clear. Asking where God is in our particular situations in life is a worthwhile thing to do, but we need to be careful that we are looking in the right place the answer to this question. Because if we don't look in the right place, we will still find an answer to the question, where is God in my life? It just won't be a good answer. So, as Christians, I do believe it is part of our Christian responsibility to ask this question, where is God in our life and our world, but the question is where? Where do we look for? This is the important question that must be answered. And, you know, as much as I love the Old Testament and everything that it has to teach us about who the Lord is and how he works in our world, the fact is you won't find a definitive answer to this question in the Old Testament. You can search the story of Samuel and everywhere else in the Old Testament, but you won't find a definitive answer that translates into our context of where is the Lord in my life today. In order to answer that question faithfully, we need to turn to the New Testament. And actually, the very first verse of our Gospel reading does give us an answer to this question. In John 1.43, the Apostle writes, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip there and said to him, Follow me. See, this is the answer to the question, where is God in our world? We look for the answer to that question in Jesus. Because it is in Jesus that God has found us first. And we see that quite clearly as uh, the, the story of our gospel reading unfolds uh, with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, as we heard, was a bit of a skeptic. Maybe that's an understatement, uh, but it's certainly true. And so finally, when his friend Philip convinced Nathaniel to go with him to see Jesus, we read these words of Jesus as he spoke to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now these words are quite profound as the Gospel writer makes clear, because it's in these words that Jesus reveals to Nathaniel that he knew him. He had found him before Nathaniel ever found Jesus. And so this is the lesson that we ought to take away this morning. We might want to look for God in the big, grand things of this life. We might want to look for God in an international pandemic, in our national politics, and in the important events of our life. But you're not going to find God in an international pandemic. You're not going to find God in our nation's politics, at least not apart from Jesus. Because it's in Jesus that God has revealed himself to us. It's in Jesus that God has found us. It's in Jesus that God has given himself for us on the cross to suffer and to die and to give us new life. And so, my friends, my encouragement for you to say is this. When life gets messy, and it will, when you sin, when others sin against you, when life gets messy, don't look for God in that mess. Look for God in Jesus. Look for God in the places that he has promised to meet us, in his word. And in the sacraments. 
Because it's when we look to Christ's word and sacraments that we'll finally find what we've been looking for all along. That is hope and comfort and peace that passes all understanding. In the name of Jesus, amen.